Welcome to the biology section of our practice MCAT questions. In this video, we're going to be going through questions 126 to 130. So first I'll show you guys the questions so that you can pause the video and attempt them on your own. Here's question 126, 127, 128, 129, and 130. Now let's go through the questions together. In question 126, it says gap junctions in cardiac myocytes are quite important for heart function. Their main purpose is for blank. So we're talking about gap junctions and we wanna know their main purpose. What is the main reason that they exist? Option A is saying allowing for propagation of action potentials. Yes, this is true. The main purpose that they exist is so that we can speed up action potentials. In action potentials, we have different concentrations changing of different ions, like sodium and potassium, as well as calcium. So we're changing the concentrations of these ions, which propagates an action potential. In neurons, the way we do it is we have a postsynaptic neuron, and then it releases some neurotransmitters into a synaptic cleft, which then go and bind to the... We have a presynaptic neuron, and then that one releases those neurotransmitters, and then in the postsynaptic one, they go and bind, and then we have propagation of the action potential from one neuron to another. But instead of having this cleft and this slowing down of the action potential by having the neurotransmitters go across the synaptic cleft, we can make it faster if the cells are directly connected and there's a kind of gap between them, a hole in which these ions, which propagate the action potential, can just easily transfer from one cell to the other. So this just speeds things up. It speeds up the action potential and it makes sure that the cells, that the cells are having the action potential in a more close fashion so they have it at like the same time and then they contract at the same time because the heart its contraction and the timing of that is very important and it also needs to be strong enough and we need to have enough cells especially in the ventricles to contract at the same time to get that pressure going so yes they allow for propagation of action potentials b structural stability no they don't really provide that much of a stability to the cells so that's not really what they're for nutrient transport between cells no, they transport ions involved in the action potential, but not really nu nutrients. That would be the responsibility of other, you know, post membrane or transmembrane proteins. So not gap junctions. And then D is of course correct. Uh, sorry, D is of course incorrect because we said B and C are incorrect. So A is the correct answer here. In question 127, it says pulmonary sur surfactant, it lines the surface of the alveoli to decrease the surface tension of its fluid lining. Which of the following effects would most likely result from a deficiency in pulmonary surfactant? So this surfactant, it helps the alveoli decrease their surface tension. And then what would happen if we had a deficiency in it? So we know the function of it. What happens if we don't have this thing? So the main purpose of this surfactant, when it decreases the surface tension, it's relating to pressure. So it, allow, it allows the alveoli to properly you know, inflate and expand so that they can be filled up with oxygen. And then it also prevents them from collapsing due to too much pressure buildup. So that's their importance. So they help the proper functioning of the alveoli. This is of course the part of the lung where we have gas exchange happening. So if we have something which is important for their function and we have a deficiency in it, that means the alveoli can't really perform their function. Therefore, we don't have proper gas exchange going on. So we don't have enough oxygen coming in that we need and enough carbon dioxide going out. So op option A is saying that the effect of a deficiency in the surfactant would lead to a decreased stress on the diaphragm. That's incorrect. If anything, we would probably have an increased stress because we need to breathe even harder to get more oxygen in. So that's going to be more stress on the diaphragm. B, increased systemic blood pressure. That's incorrect. There isn't really a direct relationship between like the alveoli and its functions changing and how that's going to affect the blood pressure in the circulatory system. That's more so if something happened in the heart. C, increased oxygenation in the lungs. Now, if anything, it would actually decrease it, not increase it. So that is incorrect. And then D is correct. It would restrict airflow into the alveoli because they can't really expand properly. In question 128, it says catabolism of long chain fatty acids is facilitated by the blank. So we're talking about catabolism. So the breakdown, 
long chain fatty acids. Those are that's a key word that we're looking at in this question. So which organelle in the cell is responsible for this? It's not the rough or the smooth ER. The rough ER is for translating protein. That's where the ribosomes are. Smooth ER has other functions such as uh, you know, creating lipids as well as hormones. And those lipids would be for the plasma membrane, but it's not responsible for breaking down fatty acid chains, the long chain ones. It's not the Golgi apparatus either. This is the transport organelle in the membrane. It can package things into vesicles for transport around the cell or secretion from the cell. And therefore proxosomes, the remaining one, that's our correct answer. So know that one of the functions of proxosomes is to break down long chain fatty acids using the process of beta oxidation. So that, that catabolic process takes place in the proxosome. So all the anabolic and catabolic processes that you learned, make sure you know which site in the cell they take place. So in this case, proxosomes. In question 129, it says human gut bacteria fall into which category of biological interactions? So we're talking about our gut bacteria and then which category? And then we're talking about biological interactions. We're talking about symbiosis in this case. And this is when we have interaction between two organisms. One of them benefits, and then the other one can either benefit in a positive sense, or it can be harmed. So there's a negative effect, or there can be a neutral effect, meaning it doesn't really get affected. And the other organism does benefit, but the one in that it's that it has a symbiotic relationship, the one that's its host, does not really get either positively or negatively affected, so it's neutral. So those are the three types. Parasitism, that is when the host is negatively affected. So if there's a parasite, it can be taking some nutrients away from a host, and it does this at the cost of the host, so the host can't really have access to these nutrients. Therefore, that's a negative effect, but that's not what's going on here. Our gut bacteria, they fall into option B, the category of mutualism, and what this is is when there is a positive effect for the host. So that means that the, the organism that has a symbiotic relationship and the host, both of them, they are benefiting. And what happens in our gut bacteria is that we have you know, bacteria in our gut that help us digest, digest our food, some of the food that you know, we need help digesting and then releasing the nutrients from, they help us do that. They also protect us from other harmful bacteria so they can you know, be a part of this protection as well. So they offer us a number of benefits and then they also benefit because they're getting access to the food that we eat and the nutrients. So there's a positive aspect of this relationship for both organisms. So therefore it's mutualism. And then commensalism is when one benefits but the other one is not affected either positively or negatively, but that's not our relationship because we are also positively affected. And D is also incorrect because B was correct. So B is the correct answer here. In question 130, we're asked which of the following correctly depicts the H zone in a sarcomere. So make sure that you know the sarcomere, the unit in muscles, striated muscles, and the H zone, which one is correct about it. Make sure you know all the different zones and bands in a sarcomere and you know what they represent or encapsulate. So here is a diagram. Option A is saying it is a region in which the Z line intersects with thin filaments. And no, this is incorrect. The Z lines would kind of be, if you're looking at the bottom one, if you're looking at the bottom part, the Z lines would be over there. And they're made up of just thin filaments. But the H zone, you can see that it's right here in the middle. It's not coming close to where the Z lines are. And yeah, the Z line is made up of these thin filaments. And a sarcomere is a unit that is between these two Z lines, but it doesn't relate to the H zone, which is what we're asked about. So therefore, A is a, an incorrect answer. So A is wrong. B is saying it is composed entirely of thin filaments. Going back here, you can see that there are thick myosin filaments, thin actin filaments. And zooming in over here, the thinner lines are the thin filaments. The H zone is actually the part where we only have thick filament. So it's the opposite. It's not where we only have thin filaments, it's where we only have thick filaments. So B is incorrect. C is saying it is composed of a mix of thin and thick, but no, we only have thick, not thin, and then therefore D is correct. 
it's saying it intersects with the A band. And then going back one last time, you can see over here, the A band is going throughout the entirety of a, where the thick filaments are. And the H zone is within that. It's a part that's only thick filament and not thin filament. So yes, the H zone is inside the A band. So we can say it does intersect with the A band. So D is correct. That's it for the questions in this video. If you enjoyed what you saw, make sure to check out our course. The link is right here on the page as well as in the description below. And in that course, we go through a lot of questions just like this and go through all the different answer explanations. And otherwise, make sure to subscribe here to this channel to stay up to date with the videos that we post here. That's it for this video. I'll see you guys in the next one.